This podcast has been recorded across various First Nations lands. We would like to pay our respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where Asia Education Foundation is based, and extend that respect to other First Nations lands from where you're listening today. Welcome to the second series of Building Bridges, a podcast by Asia Education Foundation that explores the people, places and relationships of Asia Education Foundation's long-running Australia-Asia-Pacific Bridge Schools Partnerships Program. I'm Jennifer Starr, Manager of International Education Partnerships at Asia Education Foundation, and I'll be your host for our first episode. Asia Education Foundation is an initiative of AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne, providing school leaders, teachers and students with the global perspectives and tools to amplify their intercultural skills and mindsets. We deliver informative resources, national and international professional learning and build networks that connect Australian schools with countries across the Asia-Pacific region. The Bridge School Partnerships Program is AEF's flagship international school partnerships program. Bridge stands for Building Relationships Through Intercultural Dialogue and Growing Engagement. Operating for over 12 years and across 23 countries in the Asia-Pacific region, Bridge establishes partnerships between educators, students and school communities with the goals of improving educator capacity, building people-to-people links and helping students become truly global citizens. When we started thinking about Series 2 of Building Bridges at the start of this year, we were looking forward to 2021 being a year of rebuilding, a year of opening up and a year of getting back to regular life after the massive disruptions caused by COVID last year. But as you well know, 2021 didn't turn out exactly the way we had hoped. Across Australia and throughout the world, COVID-19 continued to upend our lives both professionally and socially. In schools, teachers again had to flip between remote learning and in-person delivery, as well as supporting their students through a time of great uncertainty, anxiety and fatigue. It's these teachers, the teachers of the Bridge School Partnerships Program, who are at the heart of this series of Building Bridges. And while we won't be focusing on COVID explicitly in our episodes, it sits behind every conversation that we have had with every one of our teachers. And we figured that you've probably heard enough about COVID at this stage anyway. For some of the more established partnerships, the continuing disruption caused by the COVID pandemic didn't affect their work together all that much. They'd met at a face-to-face bridge professional learning program in pre-pandemic times, they'd visited each other's schools and they'd developed a working relationship via shared student and teacher activities. For other partnerships that were established in the past two years, such as the teachers that we're talking to later in this episode, travel restrictions have meant that in real life meetings and reciprocal school visits have been off the cards. For these teachers, they've built and grown their partnerships and professional relationships purely online. Over the next four episodes, you'll hear how these teachers connect themselves and their students, the innovative ways they support intercultural understanding in their classrooms and school communities, and most strikingly, the commitment, creativity and resilience they show every day. In this series, we'll also be speaking to researchers, leading thinkers and educators about the themes that arise in conversation with our teachers. Each episode will be a resource for bridge partnerships and educators seeking to improve their intercultural learning in their school communities. If you've listened to our first series of Building Bridges, you might be familiar with the acronym SDG. SDG stands for Sustainable Development Goals, and these goals are the foundation on which all of the bridge school partnerships are built. But what are they and why are they useful in an education and intercultural learning context? We spoke to Hamish Curry, Executive Director of Asia Education Foundation, to get the answers. Well, the Sustainable Development Goals were released by the United Nations uh, in 2016. uh, And I think really they're driven by an energy to try and uh, address some of the major global issues of our times. uh, And uh, 
things that were endorsed by countries around the world uh, on key priorities. And, and there are 17 of these goals that have been shaped. Many of them are based around the environment, around people uh, and around infrastructure. Uh, and of course, there are also ones there that um, look at the ways in which we understand the role of um, dignity, decency and justice. And so I think they're all elements in which uh, schools can have a role to play through a whole range of different ways. And there's some amazing um, examples out there of what schools have done. I guess the irony is that 2030 is only or well, less than nine years away. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary um, if you think about the scale of those goals. Uh, and we've just come off um, the climate summit uh, in Glasgow where the world is really starting to take this much more seriously and leaders are being um, expected to take this much more seriously. So I think the SDGs provide one of the most powerful levers that we have to create a global shared narrative in this space. There are a whole series of informing publications and research that informs those SDGs. And so if you look at the one on education, there's everything from um, current events to news uh, to uh, then some of the statistics um, about it. Uh, and of course, an opportunity to have a look at some of the um, progress and info, um, which is everything um, often from uh, basic literacy and numeracy and lifting uh, uh, the education of children in, in very um, low infrastructure, low income um, communities. And of course, an opportunity for other parts of the world to look at what they're doing to support that and how they're contributing to, to uh, advancing quality education. And that's something where I think the, the Bridge School Partnerships program that AF has been doing actually plays quite a, a small but significant role. We asked Hamish what were some of the potential barriers for teachers wanting to incorporate the SDGs into their classroom practice. So I think that's where the challenge of the SDGs and them being able to be translated and being able to be understood within the context of a teacher and their classroom and their students can present some challenges. And there have been many different uh, organisations and resources created to help teachers break those down. I would say very often when we have worked with our uh, bridge teachers on looking at the SDGs, sometimes it's the first time they've had a look at these or they are aware, but they've never looked at all those elements of breakdown. So we do things like showing them things uh, like world, the world's largest lesson, which is a, a website which actually has a whole lot of resources created by other schools and other teachers on how they've addressed the SDGs. And so that then can immediately give teachers one example of, oh, I see how you could interpret it, how you could apply it. I think it's also really important to understand that particularly in Australia, the Australian curriculum aligns and provides lots of platforms to leverage the SDGs. And so this is where it's always opportunity to complement what schools are doing. It's not designed to be a, this is another thing. Uh, and there are many wonderful ways and wonderful examples where schools have really leveraged the SDGs, either at a classroom level or even schools that have adopted one SDG for the whole school and every part of the school is expected to do something about that one SDG between now and 2030. So each year is a different SDG. So some of the work that schools are doing is, is extraordinary. Hamish goes on to explain the reason why the SDGs serve as a starting point for the Bridge School Partnerships. What I would say about the opportunities for intercultural understanding uh, and the way in which we use the SDGs is that if you're really trying to help people develop intercultural understanding, then providing a way for us to start to create a shared connection, something that we both might care about is the best way to do it. And it's something that even the research um, has started to advocate much more of, that if you're trying to develop intercultural understanding, it is better to work with similarities first than highlight the differences between two very different people from two different cultures or countries. A sense of connection and a sense of empathy um, creates a lot more progress. And then we start to work at how, do, how because we both care about it, how does this look different from your perspective and in your context? 
Uh, we both want a positive outcome. And I think that's why we've used the SDGs as one significant lens for our Bridge School partnerships, because either um, if I think about examples of some of our Bridge Schools from India, their focus on the SDGs usually uh, shocks our Australian educators because they do it to such committed levels. They do it at whole school. They do it in um, extracurricular. They do it in significant school projects that actually put the kids on uh, significant uh, event stages, you know, where the kids have to now debate and advocate and report back about what they are doing at their school on the SDGs. And so it really surprises our Australian teachers that they want to step up now and go, gosh, we, we could be learning a lot more um, with our colleagues overseas. And I think that's one of the great levelers that um, if it was about specifically just curriculum, it could get a little bit protectionist. You know, this is our curriculum, this is your curriculum. But the SDGs create almost, if you like, a common curriculum that we all agree is not up for debate. So if there are teachers out there who are interested in using the SDGs in their classroom, where should they start? You start with your students. And even if you take them at their highest level with just the titles and the symbols, anyone can start to understand. I, I get what that is trying to look at and what that's trying to do. I would say one of the most surprising things that I found when I started at AEF and, and we were doing youth forums around Australia using the SDGs with primary and secondary students. And we would give students the opportunity to choose, you know, which SDG would they and their group like to focus on? Uh, what we found is a really interesting pattern uh, that the top three that students often chose, the first one was actually quality education. So ironically, they all cared about quality education. And I, I think there's a really interesting narrative there. Kids care about having a good school and they care that other kids have a good school. Uh, the second one was gender equality, which perhaps shouldn't be that surprising, but um, I would say maybe more tending to be um, uh, female students. However, not so much. You know, the, the opportunity where gender equality was seen as a priority for students is something that we picked up. And the third one, weirdly, was life below water. For some reason, there's this weird kind of pattern where lots of kids have gravitated to life below water. I would say it's um, an opportunity for teachers to start a conversation with children. And one person I would actually recommend that we've been connecting with a little bit is um, a, a, a woman by the name of Annie Woolard. She's, she's an Australian and she runs an organisation called uh, Footprints on the Globe, which is entirely designed around helping teachers to translate the SDGs um, into teaching and learning um, practices and units of work, but actually Annie's uh, shares the same uh, philosophy that we do, that they should complement the curriculum, not sit as an outside or as an, an additional thing in the curriculum. The concept of the SDGs is introduced to participating teachers in a multi-day professional learning program. Here, teachers meet for the first time and utilise design thinking processes to jointly develop the themes and higher level goals of the partnership. But as we mentioned earlier, partnerships established in the last two years didn't get the opportunity to meet in real life. The first partnership we'll be exploring is that between Indrapalli State High School in Queensland and Fetuvalu Secondary School in Tuvalu. Tuvalu is an island country in the Polynesian subregion of Oceania in the Pacific Ocean. Teachers Jack Treby and Taval Alaseta were part of the Australia Pacific Bridge School Partnerships Program in 2021 and attended a virtual professional learning program throughout July and August this year. Taval and Jack told us about their schools. My school is located in the capital of Tuvalu. Uh, Fetuvalu Secondary School is the name of my school. It's a day school uh, school in Tuvalu. There are two secondary schools in Tuvalu, one in the capital and one is the uh, other island. 
Uh, sometimes we call Fetu Valo Secondary School as uh, FSS, the school of uh, Form 2, which is year 8 to year 13, which is Form 7. Uh, for Form 6 and Form 7, we, uh, year 12 to and year 13, we, uh, we run the prelim program under the USP, the University of the South Pacific and the foundation uh, program where uh, form two and form five, year eight to year 11, they, we are on a uh, Cambridge uh, syllabus. Our students were almost 300. I'm not sure the, uh, the amount, but I think it's almost 300 students. Indrapilly um, State High School uh, is in the suburb of Indrapilly, um, quite close to the University of Queensland in St. Lucia. And we currently have around 2,500 enrolments uh, and we are a uh, school from year seven to year 12, um, not very far from, uh, from Brisbane. So as a school, we're a very uh, multicultural school. So there's over 80 countries of birth represented here. Uh, and we've got students also that do EALD programs um, to help with their uh, English language learning. Uh, and we've got um, languages programs of excellence of Spanish immersion and Chinese acceleration. Uh, yeah, a very multicultural school. Um, you know, the students have a very strong interest in social justice, uh, in the environment, and um, yeah, very um, passionate, you know, advocates for the right thing, I would say, our students are. While their partnership is still in its infancy, Taval came to the program with some clear ideas on what she wanted to achieve. To improve my ICT skills, the other thing is to improve my intercultural understanding in my partner country and the education system and the curriculum and also to design thinking and problem solving the new technology that we use, like uh, Google Meet. Uh, learn more some uh, teaching strategies that used by my school partner, so I can apply to my school in Tuvalu. As Head of Languages and Global Citizenship at Indrapilly State High School, Jack came to the program with a nuanced view of global citizenship. When we speak about global citizenship, I think it's important to do a little bit of myth busting first, just so we know we're, we're talking about the same thing, because I think sometimes there's a misconception that global citizenship is external facing, it's um, you know exclusively learning about culture, or it's just about international um, focus areas. But global citizenship and, and the way that it's articulated by a range of organizations, it, um, it's, a, it's a mindset. Um, first and foremost, but it's also a skill set. So it's about uh, having effective communications. It's about intercultural understanding. It's about demonstrating empathy and having an understanding and an awareness of local and global issues and having that disposition towards taking action to, to make the world a better and fairer place. So I see it as really central to our work as educators. As you can tell, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. So I just think it's absolutely critical. Jack goes on to explain how the partnership is developing. My current uh, bridge partnership with Tavau and Tuvalu uh, is very new, very fresh. So we're in the stage where we're uh, finding out about each other and uh, identifying groups of students to take part in the, uh, in the exchange and, and talking about what that would look like. And so the other day I was in class with uh, a group of 15-year-olds and I, I showed them a brief video. I, I just I contextualised what we were aiming to do and I said, look, you know, who's heard of who's heard of this country? You know, Tuvalu and the Pacific, and you know, they hadn't. And so then I showed them a, a brief video, and they saw what it looked like. Uh, and when you say, look, oh, it's it's the um, you know the fourth smallest country in the world, and it's one of the least visited countries in the world, and they, you know, they don't have any ATMs, and they don't have you know access to groundwater. And so they were just started to get really fascinated about that. And so then we actually generated a series of questions that they want to ask, you know, their, their teenage counterparts uh, in Tuvalu, like, you know, like, what, what, you know, what do you eat? Where does your food come from? And, and what do you do on the weekend? And do you have TikTok and Instagram? And, 
it's really interesting because I think they were um, probably surprised that there was something that they had absolutely no awareness of. Uh, and so that obviously created curiosity. And I think they're really looking for that, you know, what are the universal elements of, of teenagerhood that they will find? But also, you know, gosh, your life is very different to my life. I wonder what that's like. So um, it was it actually surprised me the depth of their interest and enthusiasm in this. And so I was actually really chuffed um, in a world that has so much emphasis on technology and, and social media and the world is very small and it's in the palm of your hand. But really, the world is, is still much more than that. And I guess it's our role to, um, to, to teach them about that. During their time interacting online as part of the Virtual Professional Learning Program, Taval and Jack hit on an idea that would help frame their thinking and drive the design of their student activities. When I was uh, liaising with uh, Taval along the, um, throughout the Bridge uh, Talanoa sessions where we were, I guess, getting to know each other and uh, starting to articulate some of our ideas and, and seeing where interests uh, lay for each school, we had a discussion and Taval went away and came back and said, look, well, you know, someone who, um, you know, works at my school has su- suggested this Greek word, uh, oikos, which means, you know, like the, the whole house or, or where you learn from each other and where you share things. And I said, look, yep, yeah, that's fantastic. And we can go with that. And I said, well, you know what? I'd be really curious. Do you have a word in the Tuvaluan language that kind of, you know, encompasses uh, something around that? The idea they came up with was called toku fale. Uh, we designed the name according to our uh, the SDG that we choose. Dokufale means uh, into, it's a Tuvaluan word means my home, my house. We choose uh, Dokufale because it's the first place where the children start to learn from how to talk, how to respect. Also, Tokufale is the first place to discipline and the children know their values and morals. That's why we choose um, Tokufale to name our project. That's sort of the evolution of that name. And, um, and I'm keen to see also, you know, how that um, sort of understanding develops. But, um, yeah, that was, I mean, quite a, a beautiful journey. Uh, and I got to learn a handful of words and do a bit of, you know, um, Googling to kind of find out a bit more about these meeting huts and things like that. So um, so that's where the name came about. Taval outlines the SDGs that their project, Toku Fale, is built on. Okay, we define quality learning with Jack. It's determined how much and how well the student learn from. So if I relate the... Um, the Kufale to our free SDG that we choose the quality learning, gender equality, and climate change. For quality learning, if there's no home for a child, how can a child learn? If a child brought up in a good home, as we can see now, child have a good life. For gender equality, Home is the first place to know our morals and values. Respect, respect to others. So in home, if we mistreat our family members or our wife, husband, or child, so as our child grow up, they will do the same thing. If a child brought up in a family that most of them they know how to share respect know his title or her title in the family then we can see that that child treat everyone around them fairly and no discrimination for Tuvalu and other Pacific Islands the importance of the SDG concerning climate change is immediate recently at the Glasgow climate change conference Tuvalu's foreign minister Simon Kofi delivered a speech stressing the danger that his home was facing due to rising sea levels. The camera pulled back to reveal Kofi standing in thigh deep ocean waters, a powerful illustration of the danger these small, low lying islands face. There's such an immediacy around um, climate action 
in terms of Tuvalu and its its precariousness as an atoll, and you know, with the ocean on both sides, and um, you know, when like w- what's going to happen in twenty years and in fifty years, and so I think, you know, for me, um, when when I spoke to my students the other day, and I said, you know what, we talk about climate action, and we know that it's important, but you know what, like imagine actually if your home is at stake, you know, and some of their questions are like, well, what happens if there's a tsunami? And I said, you know, that's that's a very that's a very good question. Another SDG that resonated with Tavao and Jack was that of gender equality. The last one of gender equality, that came out uh, from one of Tavao's comments that uh, at her school there were some issues of some negative attitudes towards the female students from both male students and female students. So um, I think that's something that she's noticed. And also, you know, in, in society that, you know, there's been a lot of progress, but obviously still a bit of a ways to go. So um, you know, and that's interesting. And I, what I would love is, I guess, for students to be working with students to to talk about that. And you know, at Indrapilly here, we have um, you know a very, I guess, progressive school culture in terms of that. And we have lots of students that are um, um, you know gender fluid or students that are trans. And so there's a lot of, I guess, general awareness and acceptance and education here. Um, you know, obviously there's still work that we can do as a school around gender equality, but I think it'll be a really interesting conversation when students can can talk about that uh, and potentially, you know, generate strategies together about what, what can be done to make the situation better. The initial partnership activities have included student video introduction and letter writing activities, a great way for students to connect as they begin their own relationships. They just sent a video introducing themselves we just started last week and now I told my student to write a letter and I send it to Jack about themselves, about the school, House to value, and whether they really want to have a friend from Australia. Rather than rely on the post to send their letters across the ocean, the pair have set up a shared Google Drive folder where they're able to store videos, photos and letters for the students to easily access. You know, really, when you've got um, shared folders and shared documents, it's kind of amazing, I guess, and and particularly the last year and a half or almost two years uh, with the impact of COVID, having to sort of pivot and and really examine the way we use technology, our technological skills here, and I'd probably say fairly most places around the world, have really, uh, really deepened. So, uh, I think working and collaborating in, in online spaces is something that's going to become increasingly important. Um, so having that that increased skill set is great. And so yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, yeah how that goes. I guess we've we've started that um, that that building a relationship thing, and I think that's really an, a really important first step uh, to know who you're working with and why. Uh, and then obviously once you've built up that relationship, then we can start you know, unpacking some, you know, design thinking approaches and getting students to do some synchronous video uh, sessions and things like that. You know, maybe you've been teaching for 30 or 40 years and don't feel like they're very confident using technology, but having to go through this process and, and, you know, uh, what is it? Necessity is the mother of invention. I think we've really, because we've needed to use it uh, in different ways, we've learned how to use it in different ways. And I think our, our teaching now is benefiting from that even when we're back at school. Maybe in the future I will send my, if I have a son or daughter, maybe I'll send to my partner school because I know more about that school. Then maybe later on if I migrate to New Zealand and Australia, maybe I know some school there. Then I can come and volunteer on uh, Jack's uh, school. We finished our conversation with Tavao and Jack by asking what advice they had for teachers thinking of establishing a bridge school partnership. Uh, I think they, uh, I will encourage them to join, to know other, especially uh, Australia's um, school, how they run their school, the teachers, the children, the culture they play in their school. So I encourage them to join to the bridge um, program. Find the right team. And by that, I mean, um, find your, uh, you know, the, the teacher that's going to be the, the hero of the project and can really, um, um, you know, show up to it in the way that it needs to. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to kind of see it through. 
And then I also think um, finding the right students to take part in it as well. Um, because I, I guess it's like anything, it'll be as meaningful as you, as you allow it to be. Um, so I think, you know, getting some students that are really keen to take part, that are really passionate um, would be fantastic. So by doing that, I think you'd set up the program really well and uh, ensure that it would be a program that, you know, goes not just for a year, but that kind of um, is like those wonderful success stories you hear that have been going for years and years uh, and is really embedded in the school community. Thanks for joining us on this first episode of Series 2 of Building Bridges. Thanks to our special guests for this episode, Hamish Curry, Taval Alaseta and Jack Treby. In the next episode, we'll be speaking to teachers from Marrickville Public School in New South Wales and Kam Tieng Anusorn School in Thailand. We'll also be speaking with ABC TV presenter Namilla Benson and the National Gallery of Victoria's Learn team about the role that art plays in promoting intercultural understanding. The Australia Asia Pacific Bridge School Partnerships Program is supported by the Australian Government and implemented by Asia Education Foundation at the University of Melbourne. We thank the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for their ongoing support of Bridge School Partnerships across the region. This podcast series would not be possible without them. If you would like more information on being part of the Bridge School Partnerships Program or Asia Education Foundation, head to asiaeducation.edu.au. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter with the handle at Asia Education or contact us via the website. Building Bridges is presented and produced by Asia Education Foundation with support by Dave Rogers and DFAT. Intro music by Shufam, outro music by Matt Piesi at Mixtape Studios.